Welcome to another edition, the Friday edition, the end of the week edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 507. I'm assuming, I checked it like half an hour ago. It's Friday, the brain is gone. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the day after Ascension Day, May the 31st, 2009, quite close to my birthday. Ascension Day. We're going to talk about that in a minute. First, let's talk about your responsibility as an important viewer of the program. You need to subscribe to our show, comment on our show, share our show, like our show. But for, you know, foremost of anything, you need to watch the show. And we appreciate you doing that. Gavin, you almost had your own Assumption Day. <laughs> yes. and it didn't make <laughs> here's how this started i uh was busy yesterday morning and i log on to facebook for a second and i see some medical distress on gavin's uh facebook page saying he's going to the hospital well when that happens my heart rate goes up and i have a heart attack i contact george george did you hear this Gavin's George never the, knows anything. He so. doesn't know anything. Well, he's at the hospital? Well, I hope he paid his bill. And so I'm like, well, we better find out what's going on. Gavin was kind enough to update us throughout the day of what was happening. Uh, you went to the hospital for what reason, Gavin? Well, about a month ago, I cycled too hard and fast up a hill on a bicycle trying to catch a train. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a rather nasty cardiac episode. And... Um, I, th I thought I was dying. There we are. I caught the train. And what really worried me was that sitting down an hour later on the train, the same, the same episode came. And I, and I thought, okay, I really am dying. Um, I must do one of two things. I must either call an emergency and get to the hospital or I will go to my meetings. I have a fairly binary attitude to this. I thought, well, if I'm going to die, and die anyway, there's no point in distressing people. I'll just, just as George said, be an Agatha Christie figure with a clutching a an old fashioned railway ticket between my teeth. And <laughs> <laughs> we found the folded bicycle in the back. Class yeah. coach. <laughs> uh, or, or I won't die, and I can go to the meetings. But there's no point at all in spending the day in emergency and hospital. That never achieves anything. Anyway, that I thought. Well, I just I'll just keep quiet about it. I didn't die, but but my heart and my chest were, were not in very good shape and haven't been since then. Mm -hmm. So I have some particularly nasty symptoms. And unfortunately, my wife asked me to carry some very heavy bricks. Uh, and as I set about doing it, I realized, I, you know, my whole system said, really don't do this. So I, I had to say, I'm sorry, I can't carry these bricks. So she said, why not? And then, of course, I had to explain the whole story, at which point she handed me the phone and said, phone the doctor. <laughs> and I said, I don't want to phone the doctor. Anyway, I did have to phone the doctor. Oh, in time, Gavin, this story will improve so that your wife was having you make bricks, <laughs> right. but she would not give you any straw. Yeah, we but need to work I, on the story I, a little, okay? I, 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 why can't you make bricks without straw? See, in my, in, in my house, the interrogation by the wife is more fearsome and heartbreaking and um, heart-causing chest pain. Than but, the she, bricks. but she's a German from Wisconsin, and she starts out, <laughs> we have ways of making you talk, Kevin. <laughs> I'm, I'm not actually going to explain the whole story, but I believe my wife is quite as scary as yours is, Kevin. <laughs> However, I, I got, after this forensic investigation and a few pieces of good advice for not having fessed up earlier, I, write, uh, I was astonished. It takes three days to get an appointment, and the once I discovered, told the surgery what had happened. They said, we'll see you in 20 minutes. So I got on my motorbike, went down there, met a very nice Bulgarian doctor, a woman doctor in her 40s. And the very, very nice thing was she was as round as I was. So I thought, that's great. She's not going to tell me about my weight. Diet. <laughs> However, she said, I'm calling an ambulance. You're going straight to emergency. And I said, no, 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 my, my motorbike's in the car park. I'll get a fine. Let me, let me go home first. So we had a bit of a fight, but she did let me go home on the motorbike. Mm -hmm. uh, and anyway, the ambulance then came. What I then wanted to do was to do morning prayer before the ambulance came. So, so there wasn't any embarrassment. And I didn't have to say anything in public because we English get very embarrassed. I'm not quite, despite my effusion of the moment, I'm not quite as ready to talk about personal medical details as, as many other people. No. However, I, uh, I, I, I went to the hospital 
uh, and to to keep it at its simplest my heart rate has been at about between 80 and 120 for 30 years because of this nasty atrial fibrillation and it's been getting worse they've given me a nice drug which they said <laughs> has a side effect of making you depressed. Can you cope with that? I said, well, if, if you keep me alive and reduce my heart rate, I, I, will, I will look on the bright side of life. <laughs> anyway, the good news is that my heart rate is down to about 60-something for the first time in 30 years, and I'm feeling a bit ebullient. I think the problem is not going to be depression. It's going to be keeping me, <laughs> keeping me from jumping up and down with joy all the time. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not dead. Uh, what's that wonderful song in the Holy Grail? Not, well, not I'm dead not dead yet. yet. Not dead. Oh, you're, you'll be I'm dead really, in a couple I mean, minutes. Can't you stick around? Live. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so thanks, but but there was a very kind. I I didn't. The ambulance came before mm -hmm. getting. I was looking forward to morning prayer so much. It was Ascension Day, and there were things I I'd been thinking about. Every time the the church year comes round, I feel I'm, I'm getting the the feast for the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, Easter, Incarnation, Pentecost ascension it's very exciting being a christian that the holy spirit tells you something fresh each year and i was getting terribly excited about ascension tide and wanting to say a few things so when the ambulance came before i could start oh lord open thou our lips i was a bit disappointed and and if i don't tell people prayers aren't going to happen they get a bit um well in english you say arsy <laughs> i don't know if you're allowed to say that in america you can say that, yeah. <laughs> They, um, they, they, they express, some of them express their opinion saying, you know, where were you? Why don't we know? Mm -hmm. So that was the reason why I, I had to put up an unwanted medical bulletin. I'm sorry, guys, I, I might not be back. <laughs> well, you just mentioned John uh, Cleese from uh, Monty Python. Great scene about not being dead yet. Are, are we allowed to say his name, Kevin, anymore? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. I just um, wanted to make sure we were. If the screen goes blank, folks, you know why. <laughs> the, the John Cleese I know, liberal, funny as can be, uh, great perspective on the whole world, and knows how to deliver humor, sarcasm, and makes us laugh at ourselves. The John Cleese of 2019 is an ultra white privileged conservative right winger. Uh, because he's uh, t trying to take on this uh, political correctness going on in London. We're being accused of also being right-wing radical Christians uh, in, in the Jimmy Swaggart um, type uh, right-wing politics. And I thought, you know, we need to defend ourselves or let, let, let people know our perspective on polity. Because the Jesus I read in the Gospels was apolitical. Every time somebody, every time somebody asked him a political question, he answered with another question, and that's his nature. And it's kind of our nature as well not to consider ourselves, even though our polity may be defined right, as that being right. We think it's centrist. Kevin, Kevin that's so helpful, uh, Richard. I'm not going to use your surname, but this is because you wrote in saying Kevin must watch his speech, speech. because because words can kill and he ought to know kevin ought to know that there are at least uh as many definitions of socialists as allah has secret metaphysical names i could have said so, democratic socialist i know <laughs> so the, the i thought this was important because a few people on the web page have said you guys are straying into politics you know who do you think you are or what do you think you're doing and um first of all i i want to write say you know of course kevin knows there are a hundred definitions of socialism um, but uh, but and I'm I loved your introduction because John Cleese, who lives willingly amongst black people or people of color or melanoma challenged people, whatever the right phrase is, has got into the most terrible trouble by saying that London is no longer English or British in any cultural sense. Um, it's also the anniversary of 1984. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm reading a really an, a most excellent book, which we might put on on the web page about Orwell's writing of it. 1984 has suddenly come of age. This is its moment. It wasn't a prophecy, it was a warning. Uh, and it was a warning uh, about what's happened to John Cleese uh, and also uh, about not misreading some of the things that we are saying. Um, I, we've never talked about it, but I don't think any of us are right wing in a collective sense. I imagine that the politics that, between the three of us, we would differ 
enormously on economic solutions and on some social solutions uh, and even on the virtues of capitalism. But we are united in one thing, and and the, it's the ascension that makes this more real to me today than ever. We're united in a refusal to accept what has become a collective position of most Church of England bishops and, and clergy, and that is that there is a pragmatic, utopian political expression of the kingdom within our reach if only we exercise the right political choices. Now, that's the left. What people don't often understand, because the papers, the media doesn't help us with this, is that the right is not the mirror opposite of the left. Um, indeed, we'd have trouble describing what right meant. But for our sake, I think it's, well, we probably described ourselves as centrist, most of us. But for our sake, it's a rejection of left-wing political utopianism masquerading as the kingdom of heaven, not an affirmation of any particular set of cultural or economic or political values. And it's not like the church doesn't get involved in politics, George. We just saw that Theresa May step down and the Church of England issued a statement with some quotes from Justin Welby. What were those? Well, the, the bishop... Uh one of the bishops issued a statement on behalf of the how of the lord spiritual mm -hmm. uh patting her on the back as she walked out the door and then justin welby released a statement uh, pl a uh pl applauding her resilience determination and public duty high-minded spirit which never failed her that throughout her career she put the public's duty public interest first don't think that will be universally shared. No. That's a terrible thing to say. That is just simply almost certainly not true. She was a myopic, robotic, third-rate political operator who refused to take advice and remain completely out of touch of the real real politique of the situation. I'm pleased that she and Justin had a pleasant personal relationship. Uh, and, and we shouldn't say rude things about her in public. So I'm sorry, I've just broken that. But only in response. To, to well be saying those ridiculous things um but 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 well there we are um I, well i i've broken my own rule so i'm sorry may i call that that's all right it, yeah that's what it, unscripted is for the um kevin and i share a great because we're uh, close in age and we uh, came of age in the 1980s it's kevin and i share a, essentially a common almost libertarian political worldview but we also happen to be religious. In Kevin's profession, I think most computer types are non-believers, and almost all of them used to be libertarians. But today we have uh, Google and Facebook and these monsters of collectivism, of destroying the individual in favor of uh, the, the, uh, the collective. Uh, Absolutely. That, that, George, that is so important. That's one of the key issues that we're talking about as you quite rightly say we're facing a steamroller culture of the collective which is what 1984 was the warning about mm -hmm. over against the incarnational affirmation of the sanctity of the individual and if i if d d i'm sorry i've interrupted you but keep the rest of your sentence in your head if you can one of the things i wanted to add to that was th the ascension is about many things but one of the things it does is it takes our eyes off of, of the material world as we have it, and it locates them very clearly on heaven. Now, the socialists have always hated us for that. They've mocked us and said, this is pie in the sky when you die argument. But the very fact they mock us so effectively means I think we've struck a nerve. That there is no utopian solution in a fallen world where people have to get saved to make any difference. And all the stuff about all the misreading of the poor, the humble, and the low in scripture is the, inf is, the, is the attribution of political and economic characteristics where they're meant to be spiritual. The, the, the poor and the humble in scripture uh, are, is essentially a spiritual characteristic, not a political one. Scripture makes that clear all the time. And as Kevin said earlier on, Jesus never gives political answers, ever, ever, ever. And that's what binds the three of us together. Well, one yeah. of the interesting things, we're, uh, <laughs> we're interrupting George here, the Beatitudes. Uh, are the incredible redefinition of human character. And if you get a chance, reread them again to understand exactly the character God is looking for in us through the Beatitudes. George, on to you. 
Um, if we're going to do true confessions, my self self image mm -hmm. is that I consider myself to be a man of the left. I probably am farther left than Bernie Sanders. Where I wow. disagree with him, where I disagree with him is how we achieve the aims of justice of uh, fairness, of peace, of toleration. In other words, the mechanisms and the proposals that involve coercion by the state or coercion by a, the collective against the individual, I find abhorrent. Look, I, have, I, I am, came from a privileged background. Um, I grew up in Palm Beach, Florida, and I remember something in the I and I've at one time, I contemplated going into politics and the law. And in 1979, I was home from vacation from school. I went away to school. And they were starting the presidential primary races. And there was this unknown congressman uh, from Texas who had also been ambassador to China and this and that. And he was running uh, for president. And his mother lived in the town where I lived. And his mother was a friend of a friend of my mother's. And it was said, George, we need somebody to pick him up at the airport and drive him around to do the uh, politicking. So would you mind driving your mother's Buick estate station wagon and pick up George Herbert Walker Bush at the Palm Beach International Airport? And which I did. This is before George Bush was anybody. And so I spent uh, three days and essentially driving him around to a activities. And I chatted with Bush in one or two of the uh, quiet moments. And what I came away with was, you know, I asked him why he was doing this. And he said, George, to those whom much has been given, much is required. You have been given the advantages of education, of birth and wealth, and your life will depend on what you do with those. Now, I had a religious awakening as a young man that responded in some ways to George to Herbert Walker Bush's injunctions. I'm not a political Bush person. I'm not prompting his son or anything, but that imperative to those whom much has been given, the Lord requires that you give much back, has led me. I have never had a socially prominent parish. I have spent my ministry in the, amongst the rural poor. Gavin was a priest in, I don't say, I don't think you call them slums, but what do you call yeah, them? An estate. No, when estate. I got there, they were slums. And in, in a state in South London. And our call has not been to empower the rich and the powerful. Our call has been to empower the individual with through a relationship in Jesus Christ. Now, where I uh, have problems with socialism is it's basically I have problems with socialists who are seeking to aggrandize to themselves uh, power, you know, economic power, racial power, legal power, political power at the expense I have a congregation that I, you would say, and this is a, for those who are easily offended, I'm going to offend some people. Most of the people in my congregation are what you would, my grandmother would call white trash. Um, not, you know, some people don't have all their fingers. Some people don't have all their teeth. Some people, a lot of them are raising their grandchildren because their kids have problems uh, with drugs and alcohol and this and that. Not all, of them, but there is a sizable portion there. Those people who have been left out by the American dream, either through their own choices or through this or that, the other. The causes are relevant, but the call of Christ upon me personally has been to be a vehicle of his love and help. And part of the mission that I see in our reporting and our journalism is not to push a side, but to be vehicles for the propagation of the truth. Because mm -hmm. it's the truth that will set you free, not these 39, uh, not these 10-point manifestos. And I think people need to hear that that we are not the right-wing equivalent of the left-wing people that we're, we're criticizing. Uh, there was a point when I was desperate to become a liberation theologian because it was so cool. It really was incredible. That was the way to, to social status amongst the people I was involved in. But but I've, I, at the age I am, I'm absolutely convinced of the Ashenden number one maxim, which is the more spiritually impoverished people are, the more they reach for political solutions to the expression of the gospel. In other words, if you're not depending upon the Holy Spirit, then you're likely to look for 
this dystopian, utopian, left-wing uh, replacement for it. I, I'm astonished, George, because when I was 16, I, I took, I put a piece of calligraphy on my bookcase, which was the verse from those to whom much are given, much is expected. And I wasn't a Christian at the time. I was just so completely struck by that. I, I put it up amongst my books and I looked at it every day thinking, this is, this is me. This is a, whoever wrote this, this is a call to me. Uh, I accept that it was extraordinary, it had an effect on me. Where, where people would label me a conservative or from political overtones is that I believe the capitalist system has done more to raise people out of poverty, to address the crushing, crying needs than any government organized program. Um, so it's the mechanics of how you get from A to B. Well, that would make me a conservative, but the destination is the one that I would share with our liberal uh, talking heads on television. And that's something that's just amazing. If you look through the history of mankind here on Earth, capitalism sucks, yet it's the best thing going. Nothing has been able to duplicate what capitalism has done by raising the poor out of poverty, uh, by uh, providing a clean way, a river, for freedom to continue its way in a country. Uh, democracy works okay, but representative government seems to be a better way uh, for governments to grow. These are just things we've observed through history. And, you know, when somebody complains about capitalism, I get it, but it's now, the only thing working out there. And I think because the institution of the church right now is hidebound and corrupt and institutionally oriented towards its own protection, and because its ethos is liberal, because we, we are, if you will, attacking that, well, if you're attacking a liberal institution, you must therefore, ipso facto, be a uh, knuckle-draggling troglodyte conservative. It doesn't work that way. Uh, I view myself as a Christian and, well, and, not, I, and not as a, an activist for any one side. And that's okay. why I, I, I'm slightly uncomfortable with Kevin's... Um, uh, eulogizing of capitalism, though my father, whom I loved and whose political judgment I respected, would have used almost exactly the same words as Kevin did. But I would want to add to them, any system goes very badly wrong if the mm -hmm. people at the heart of it are not converted and penitent. Mm -hmm. And one of what, whether you're talking about a soft kind of collective socialism or a soft kind of virtuous, uh, conscious written capitalism, you have to have converted Christian people to make it work or it becomes oppressive wherever it is and so uh, the position I think we share is that that one of the things that binds us together very easily with all kinds of political differences between us is we put as an absolute priority coming to know Jesus and beginning the process of, of repentance and the multiple conversions we have we have to go through and that's my beef with the Church of England that there are many people who are not born again who haven't met Jesus who treat him as a political leader not a savior uh, and who are unwilling to consider the, some of the primary steps of penitence you can't do church like that I remember meeting many people who became priests who were just joining the corporation and their way to raise up in the corporation was to become bishop and that was their goal and they would do what it took to be a bishop they would go to the right parties they would meet the right people they would do the right handshakes and it was just their corporate job and they looked at the church as a corporation thankfully there are other organizations and other people within the church who don't look at it that way who find being in the church a wonderful way to spread the gospel and it, it's a joy to watch that happen i need people to look at the, their screens right now and you're going to see kevin i have not moved up or down at all that's just how we started the show somehow in the swamplands of florida george's chair is slowly <laughs> <laughs> sinking into the marshes down there george could you sit up just for our audio there you go <laughs> Every time I look at the monitor, I'm like, do people realize he's seven foot four? You know, I'm five, six, Gavin's a little taller than I am. And you just look at the monitor and it's not a representation of who we really are. That's a that little why better. I, I loved the fact that we could come together physically in Jerusalem and have a picture of sure. the three of us with our, our, real, our real sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, Gavin, Kevin, and, and Goliath. Oh, it was great. Right. Yeah. 
Well, this, I, I think the the underlying thesis that we've expounded, this, this is what lies behind so many of the criticisms that we have. One of the things we talked about before the start of the show as we'd laid out the things to discuss, uh, we, we receive from uh, a viewer named, first name Helene, uh, what do you think of the Church of England story about Alexa? Uh, the Alexa, is that a Microsoft assistant or Google assistant? Well, I have one right here. Hold on. Let me go off camera and bring it up. This is uh, Alexa. I had to, because we have three of these, I had to rename my office one Echo. And I use Echo for everything. Watch this. This is so cool. Echo, turn off lamps. <laughs> Echo, turn off lamps. You know, technology is not perfect. Even my devices don't listen to me. It's like a kid around here. Can you do the dishes? No, I'm going to argue first. Echo, turn on lamps. Uh, and yes, the Church of England has found technology. <laughs> Look, like Echo, Kevin turn moment. on lamps. They are technology, technologically superior, but still in the dark. So in other words, as I read this article, I was thinking, isn't this neat? But then, yes, but. Congratulations, kudos to the Church of England's communications team for putting together a very effective uh, technological gizmo that allows people to ask basic questions of their device that can be answered. 75,000 people have asked questions. The problem is that the questions are being answered and Kevin had an analogy. The Church of England has built a Ferrari, but it's neglected to put any gas in the tank. Well, there's lots of great analogies <laughs> we could use. Them. That's, that's a primary one. Technology, uh, by definition, is the application of knowledge. And we've seen great uh, resources within the church using technology, the Gutenberg Bible, the printing press. You know, it was an early start to getting the common message of Christ throughout the lands. It worked wonders. Will the Alexa app for the Church of England do the same? Where there's no there there, I don't see how it could happen. Now, at the same time, we shouldn't be uh, dismissive of new technologies and its impact on evangelism. Mm -hmm. We would be foolish because, look, Gavin has uh, created out of, out of thin air if you will, an Episcopal ministry over the internet that 10 years ago wouldn't have been possible because the internet wasn't that, didn't work that way. Yet today, Gavin influences and is in contact and has a direct uh, interaction with more people than any Episcopal bishop that I know of, maybe it except is, for the presiding bishop. It is very strange. And, and, it, and it all came simply because, if I can be risk being over pious for a moment, I mean, the, the Holy Spirit said to me, I mean, really literally did say your prayers on the internet and i said lord you you're making a pharisee out of me it's just like standing on street corners and, and sh showing how well dressed i am and then and then when i was complaining to him about um, about not being able to preach in a, in a church being a pulpit he he said to me preach on the internet and i said lord for 35 years i've been learning to read people's souls by looking at their eyes as i preach and responding to what you you say to me at that moment, going off piste, it's quite scary, but it's very effective when you turn up. To, to, to preach to a camera, I'll look at a complete idiot. I, I've just put my idiot ascension sermon online this afternoon. But but what happens is the, there are people out there, and in this sense, the Church of England are, are right. Um, there are people out there who are very hungry indeed for prayer, for ministry, for, for Bible exposition. Uh, and I think we should give credit to the IT people of Church of England for beginning to try the process of making some kind of engagement. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. Um, again, it's, 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 it's how, if, if, you, if you are doing what God wants you to do, he will, he will bless what he wants to bless. It, it doesn't matter whether it's internet or standing on street corners. Well, if, he told, if he told me to stand on street corners and do that, he'd bless that and people would come to know him. I'm very quite jealous of the people who've got the courage and the gift to do that. I think that's very brave. And let, let me describe what they're doing right. They're doing right by reaching the new generation. 
Uh, I went to a, a little get together yesterday morning called the Parents Breakfast for uh, the high school graduation, where they got all the parents into a room, and we were going to have some donuts and some fruit and coffee, and discuss discuss how proud we were of our children graduating high school. And we're sitting down on couches and talking. It gets louder and louder and louder in there. I'm looking around, and I didn't see anybody on their iPhones. Wow. I didn't see anybody taking selfies with their besties friends. I didn't see anybody updating their Instagram or Facebook. I just saw people engaging and talking and sipping coffee and stuffing down donuts the way we were meant to, the way we were created to. Now, you go to the gymnasium. Uh, where they had this award ceremony for the kids and you look off to the side and kids are sneaking little selfies of themselves and they're online they're trying not to be seen by the teachers but you can see under their jackets they're they're texting their friends and Instagramming and whatever they do well you have to be able to find a way to communicate to the kids of today who spend all day looking at a device the, the size of the palm of their hand and I think the Church of England looking into that and trying to discover a way to do that is great. When you finally reach those children, please have the gospel, not some watered-down, cranky old message that we accept you and affirm you just as you are. It's time to move on. Guys, uh, I hate to cut you short, but as my son is graduating this week, I have a whole bunch of uh, meetings to run to, like I have to go pick up mom and dad at the hotel and take them out to lunch. So do you guys want to finish up with something quick? Yeah, let me just do the good news, bad news, GAFCON. Sure, yeah. Let's, let, let's, let's get in the Anglican weeds. Uh, <laughs> bad news for GAFCON this week. On uh, Monday, the new election for the Archbishop of the West Indies, Howard Gregory of Jamaica, was elected besting Philip Wright of Belize. Gregory is 68, Wright is 52, I believe. Wright has attended ACNA uh, conferences. Uh, he is on side with GAFCON. He is of the Drexel Gomez uh, coalition, faction, whatever you want to say. Mm -hmm. He lost. Really hard-nosed politicking. Uh, Gregory is a liberal Catholic uh, in Anglican terms. He has uh, called for decriminalization of abortion, decriminalization of homosexuality. He's all on the sort of progressive side. And he's young. No, he's 68. Oh, okay. I thought the, uh, the other one's saying. The oh, yeah. right, right is 52. Okay. So GAFCON could have picked up another primate and then had somebody in office for 18 years. Mm -hmm. uh, now, so that, but just look at it this way. Gregory's got two more years, and it's the Jamaicans are going to work very hard to make sure that they keep that liberal uh, hegemony. But bad news. And then good news uh, Jackson Oli Sapa, the Archbishop of Kenya, after earlier in the year and last year saying he would be going to Lambeth, has now told the Religion News Service he's not going to Lambeth. And he's not going to Lambeth over uh, Justin Welby's uh, indecision, inaction, double-minded myths over the uh, homosexuality issue. This is a coup. 2008, his predecessor, Benjamin Zimbe, did not go to Lambeth 2008, and probably 30 out of the 40 Kenyan bishops followed suit. We'll see the same thing this time around of the archbishop leading the way. That's a surprise. That is. It, so at this stage, Rwanda, Nigeria, Uganda, and now Kenyan archbishops will not be going to Lambeth 2020. And, and I'm quite sure Foley's not going to. So I'm Kevin Coulson. No, no, no. Oh, you, you got something else? You'd say we could finish up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Two things. Uh, someone's knocking at my door. Hello. Oh, it's not my wife. It's it's the Amazon man. <laughs> but, but, <coughs> you give me 30 seconds. Um, so I was going to say two things. First of all, uh, we, um, in terms of the Bishop of Chelmsford, uh, he said, uh, the Bishop of Chelmsford has, has said, uh, I've had no conversation with John Parker on mm. any matter for over a year. I'm at loss to know where this comes from, but since the heart of this story is a vulnerable child, I'm not going to get involved on Twitter. John Parker had said, I was told basically by my bishop, if I wish to follow the teachings, uh, I was no longer welcome in the church. Um, there's an issue of fact there that needs to be cleaned up. Emotionally, I'm very much on the side of John Parker, but we have to say that if the Bishop of Chelmsford says he had no conversation, one of them needs to change their account. And the last we need thing is, more information, yeah. We need more information. The last thing, finally, 
<clears throat> is that that because of the great warnings about 1984, uh, can recommend a book by Dolly Linsky, The Ministry of Truth, a biography of George Orwell's 1984. Kevin, could you put it up in case people it. read it? It's a must read. Right. I'm Kevin. I'm Kevin Coulson. <laughs> I'm George Conger, Lefty Pinko George. <laughs> I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 506 of Anglican Unscripted. Echo, turn off lamps. <laughs> <laughs>